Good morning, Penny. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. We're all excited to hear Happy what you to have to say here. today. Thank you. So as was morning, mentioned, you, you co-chair a task force of the Council on Formulations that just published a report titled The Work Ahead, mm -hmm. which by the way is in the USB drive from the chamber on your tables oh. and was very Thank interesting. You. The report contemplates the workplace of the future and the skills workers will need. What is your takeaway from the report and what are the practical implications for the world, the U.S., Chicago, and for the individual businesses in our audience? We could be here all day with that question. <laughs> I'll try to get to the heart of the matter quickly. So the Council on Foreign Relations, which is based in New York, uh, asked me and Governor Engler uh, from Michigan to lead a task force on the future of work, which we brought together 20 experts from around the United States to really think about the fundamental issue that's facing all of us in our businesses and our workforce, which is the fact that we have this seismic rapid change in what's required in our, of our workforce, really affected predominantly by automation, artificial intelligence, and to some extent globalization. And the report is really a menu of uh, options for our federal government, our state and local leaders, business leaders, and our nonprofits. And what we did is we really surveyed the country and looked at what was working and said, what, what are the ideas that we ought to be taking to scale? And the thing that motivated the report, and you may ask yourself, why the Council on Foreign Relations? But if you really think about it, helping uh, people uh, access opportunity has been one of the greatest foreign policy tools that the United States has. And so that's what motivated the Council on Foreign Relations to uh, want to create this report. Um, the suggestions or recommendations, as I said, it's really a menu. And, and if you think about our position as business leaders, um, the fundamental premise of the report is that we're in deep trouble if we do not make a closer link between what we're teaching folks uh, at various parts of their education and jobs. And that the jobs are changing dramatically. And so therefore, it really requires kind of a cultural shift of our communities where we think about how do we make lifelong learning a reality for ourselves and our workforce. So if you think about policy ideas that are required might be, how do you make a Pell Grant or a MAP Grant easier to use for skilled workforce training? Or today, if you're a displaced worker, you're mid-career, and you lose your job for one reason or another, our training dollars are frankly pitiful. We um, spend less on training than any other OECD country except Mexico and Chile. And so it really calls for trade adjustment assistance, which is really the, the federal programs that we have that can address workforce training. It's just an inadequate. First of all, it has to be, you have to prove you lost your job because of trade before you can get any assistance. And then the level of assistance is really not uh, adequate. Um, it also, uh, the report talks about the challenge of benefits. As we have 55 million Americans today who work in the gig economy or on contract work, how do they accumulate benefits? And how do we create a system where you could, as you, if you have a portfolio of work, if you will, how could you put together benefits so that you're not, uh, what it, what's the statistic? I think 50% of Americans could not afford a $400 unexpected wow. uh, payment. Um, the report has a bias, which really is, is that it, businesses need to lead. And that's really where all of you come into uh, play. What we found is, is that we have the assets in many instances, but without the kind of business leadership where you as business leaders can say, here's the needs I have in my organization and be working and insisting that our educational institutions are really aligning their curricula to uh, match up with the needs in our community. And you know, I, that's where you look at the way our community college system, for example, is divided basically based upon with each of the various colleges focused on a particular need of the greater Chicago 
uh, uh, business community, that makes a huge amount of sense. But we do need to backward integrate that also into um, the public school system, which we're doing, but we need to do more of. And what you find is, is that when businesses are leading by saying, here's what I need, and working closely with the educational institutions, and you see this in communities like Chicago, but also maybe in Houston or Dalton, Georgia, and we, we uh, in this report, talk about other communities that have examples uh, maybe narrow examples of what's working. But it's, it's extremely important. I believe this is the economic issue of our time facing our country. And if we don't get this right, our economic prosperity is very much at risk. Couldn't agree with you more. It's something we face every day in running our business to try and figure out what the future holds and what type of talent we need. So as an organization, what can the chamber do help businesses prepare for the workplace of the future, particularly with tech workers? Well, I think, you know, first of all, this idea of, a, of recognizing that we're going to have to help our workforce be lifelong learners, and that we're going to have to continue to accumulate skills. McKinsey and others have done studies that will show you that 60% of jobs are going to change over the next five to seven years. Um, Bridget outlined the apprenticeship program, which is an extraordinary uh, offering. And one of the things, in fact, that we're doing uh, to support uh, the apprenticeship offerings by uh, the companies that are engaging is now to really examine how do we make that, um, as Juan Salgado would say, the muscle infrastructure uh, between community colleges and the businesses, make that easier for businesses to participate, make it easier for the students to, to uh, get involved in a pathway from where they are in school all the way through to participating. But apprenticeships is a big way to participate. Another would be Skills for Chicago Land's Future, which is focused on hiring the longer term unemployed. These are places where um, they're great uh, offerings that can provide opportunity to folks in our communities that we may not otherwise think of as potential employees. Yeah, no, that's great. And Jack, just put that on your to-do list, please. Yeah. <laughs> when you think about the four years you spent as Secretary of Commerce for the United States, you had a, a number of significant accomplishments. What are you the most proud of? You know, first of all, as, I, as you've heard me say, I mean, it was an honor of a lifetime to serve our country, and I really uh, uh, was so proud to be able to do that. And I'm proud of many, many of the accomplishments. You know, I think stepping back before I list, you know, a few things that yeah. I think are, are really important, one of the things, the observations I have is it's really important that the United States, you know, Ronald Reagan used to say, we're the shining city on the hill. And I think we cannot forget the role, and I had the privilege of seeing this around the world, how much of the world looks to the United States as an example of providing values and examples, whether it's around lifelong learning, whether it's around human rights and other things. We have, and, and leadership like that requires generosity. Uh, and, and so it requires us as a country to think beyond just our own needs, but also how do we provide that role. And, and I saw that firsthand. And our challenge is to figure out how we can both lead at home so we create enough opportunity here in the United States as well as leading around the world in a way that feels um, uh, uh, collaborative with our most important allies. The kind of programs that I was most proud of is we really focused on foreign direct investment. For example, we created a program called Select USA. I know Chicago benefited from this dramatically, where we, for the very first time at the federal level, and you know, our state, like every other state, has economic development administration efforts where you go out around the world and try and recruit companies. But we at the federal level said, what can we do to be welcoming foreign companies into the United States. And, and we massively grew the amount of uh, companies from around the world that wanted to come and invest here and, and create employment opportunities and grow our economy. That was one thing I was very proud of. Another is advanced manufacturing. 
Um, so Chicago was the recipient of, it used to be called, um, I think, the Digital Manufacturing Institute. I think it has a new name now. But we did 14 of these types of institutes where we took um, technologies that existed that were in the laboratory and basically worked in a public-private partnership to bring those ideas from lab to market over a five-year period. And those are unbelievably successful partnerships that um, endure today in the area of advanced manufacturing. A third area that I would talk about is our digital policy. We really promoted a free and open internet and the idea, at the same time, focusing on the need to develop um, uh, parameters around privacy and cybersecurity, and you're seeing these issues really come to, come to fruition today. One of the big issues we faced in terms of privacy was um, post the Snowden revelations, the safe harbor between the EU and the United States, right. which allowed us to send digital you know, information back and forth about individuals digitally, that fell apart. And we had to replace that, which we did. We negotiated over a two-year period to put in place what we call the EU-US privacy shield. And that has allowed, because the EU has a very different way they do privacy no than the question. way we do in the United States. So aligning those two regimes was necessary in order for the EU to say, we're going to continue to allow you to send information back and forth. So imagine if you couldn't do that. I mean, yeah. think about how that would impede. We thought it would impede about $290 billion worth of trade. And is that really what created the GDPR that just went into effect? Well, in the EU? EU passed GDPR because they're very concerned. I, and, and actually, I think they're ultimately Europe is playing a leadership role in how we're going to, I think, uh, regulate privacy because of GDPR, which is a uh, European new law about how you handle uh, private and personal information for individuals who are in Europe. So you could be an American in Europe and you have to comply. Um, uh, it, I think they're going to demonstrate that we can do more to protect privacy than what we're doing here in the United States. Yeah, no question about it. And uh, so just reflecting back on your role as Secretary of Commerce, what are the key insights you took away from that job? Well, I, you know, one of, one of the most important insights I took from the job is, is the importance of American business as a foreign policy, um, as a factor in foreign policy. If you think about uh, how does the United States project its power around the world? We have military power. We have diplomatic power. But frankly, the American businesses are present all over the world. I mean, I went to Pakistan, and believe it or not, there are 85 American businesses doing business in Pakistan, uh, not the friendliest place yeah, you know, to kind of hang out, if you will. <laughs> you don't go to the cafe on the corner there. Um, but that's an amazing projection of America and our values and our power. And that was one of the most important takeaways I had, and so I found it as Secretary of Commerce, one of the most valuable things to do in terms of working with, company, with countries where we had challenges commercially was to work with American businesses and the local businesses in those countries to talk with the governments about how you make change. That's terrific. Thank you. Your firm, PSP Partners, invests in and builds businesses in a wide array of industries all over the globe. How do you determine which businesses you'd like to invest in? What are the key factors you consider? Well, we're big investors in middle market businesses, okay. so folks Thank like you. yourselves in this room. Um, it, basically, we're trying to invest in businesses where we think we can add value and be good partners with management or you know, current ownership. Uh, that often may, might be in, let's call it two, I'll give you two examples. Sure. Uh, one might be, how do you apply technology into, let's call it, areas where we know we've been investing, whether it's in uh, the industrial sector or food and, and uh, consumer products or in um, business services? Another might be we're helping businesses. We, we might get involved in a business that's trying to take 
what it's doing, you know, to other parts of the world. Yeah. So those no. are areas that we tend to try and focus on. Okay, thank you. Is there any industry that you're particularly focused on right now? Um, right now, we are doing a lot in advertising technology. Oh, no kidding. And, um, uh, which is really interesting and fast growing mo uh, advertising in the mobile video world. Sure. Uh, we're also, um, we have a, uh, uh, building products distribution company, so talk about two very different types of businesses. Yeah. But, you know, as well as a food manufacturing company. So we're different types of businesses. So you're focused on businesses that can be successful, not so much. Exactly. We're sectors. less, we're really, it's about how, who to partnership, developing relationships, and where uh, both management and we think we can be value added. No, that makes a lot of sense. I know there's only so much you could say about Chicago's bid for Amazon's mm -hmm. second headquarters, and everyone's sitting here. I asked the mayor when we were sitting at breakfast um, when he thought we would hear, and he said about five weeks was yeah. his guess. But what can we learn from the process, both positive and areas that we could focus on to be better? I think one of the great things that came out, <coughs> that has come out of the HQ2 bid so far is um, a real appreciation because we really studied and accumulated for Amazon the data about Chicago and why it's such a uh, terrific opportunity for Amazon and for other, com uh, other companies. First of all, talent, and you heard the mayor talk about it. You, you know, we've all been talking about right. this. But the talent that, it, you know, uh, is, it, cr that is created within our region that wants to live in Chicago is a huge asset. Second is affordability. You know, Chicago, believe it or not, is one of the most affordable cities when you combine sure. it with the kind of, also our university and our R&D that's going on here is, is particularly applicable. And when you think about R&D, it's not just exactly all that's going on at the universities, but it's also what's going on in places like Argonne and other places that are recipients of DOD, Department of Defense and Department of Energy. Um, the other thing is really our kind of collaborative, uh, we try harder attitude, I think, is a real asset. Uh, you know, th the challenges that uh, uh, we face, whether it's regarding Amazon or in general, are things that we know. We need to get our state finances in order, and that's something that every company that thinks about Chicago and Illinois asks about. Um, I think there's in terms of the issues around uh, uh, opportunity in all of our communities. That's another issue that uh, Amazon was quite interested in and in trying to figure out how they could be, if they came here, how they could be more helpful in those areas. Yeah, no question about it. And there's a lot to learn there and think about. Let's shift gears a bit to the Obama Library. Mm. How will the Obama Library positively affect the community it's in and Chicago as a whole? So the Obama Library is a really interesting um, uh, development because it's not really a library. Basically, all the contents or the or the most of the contents of what would be in a library are ultimately going to be digitized. So really, what we're getting with the Obama Center is a museum and a campus for convening. And the benefit to us in Chicago is, aside from you know the building of a building is really about um, three and a half billion dollars it's estimated to, will come into our economy. It should attract about 750,000 visitors a year, um, about 2,500 jobs to manage and run the center. The center will be focused aside from the fact of the museum, which is gonna be very <coughs> cool, latest yeah. technology and really an interesting place. Uh, and part of the you know, Southside Museum campus area down by uh, the Museum of Science and Industry and, it, and you know, uh, adjacent to the parks. It's, it's also you know, focused, the foundation is focused on civic leadership and investing in civic leadership in Chicago and globally. And it will be a convening institution to bring folks to Chicago for that training, as well as providing that kind of training for 
uh, leaders within Chicago, within all of our communities. So there's a lot of benefit to us in Chicago and why I know we all worked so hard to get it here. No, that's great. Congratulations and thank you. I never would have imagined 2,500 jobs at the no. library. One last question for you. Mm -hmm. What's your overall assessment of the Chicago economy right now? And what do you see as the key things we need to focus on to keep improving? Well, Chicago, you know, I, uh, I'm bullish on Chicago. We've doubled down. I mean, my I husband hope and I. all of us in the room are. Yeah, you know, um, uh, and I think that our, um, there are a couple things that I think we need to work on. I mean, we've talked about our assets. The mayor went through the five T's, and they're terrific. Uh, and we're very well positioned. But one of the initiatives that uh, the Civic Committee and the Commercial Club is working on is really how, to, how do we make sure Chicago remains a tier one tech city and right. becomes a tier one tech city. Uh, and that is uh, a, an effort that is being undertaken, led by the private sector, bringing both our established businesses and our technology businesses together to say what are our strengths, how do we you know, take advantage of the talent and education systems that we have. And DPI is a big part of it. Getting the, that off the ground is, is an important asset. How do we make sure there's enough capital so that the startup ecosystem that we have can be funded? Right. How do we make sure that um, uh, the engagement in the business community is integrated between our established businesses and our tech businesses? Because frankly, today, every company has to be a tech company. No question. Uh, and then how do we make sure that the, that, we're, um, that the infrastructure and the relationship between government and private sector and the nonprofits is functioning in an efficient format so that we can take advantage of opportunities as they present, like an Amazon HQ2. And then finally, how do we communicate the benefits of Chicago? Do, what kind of PR campaign should we have? How do we better uh, address and position ourselves in what's becoming just a more and more globally competitive environment? Yeah, no question about it. Well, thank you so much for your time. Well, and Steve, your thanks insights. for having me, and <laughs> pleasure to be here. Really appreciate it. Great, thanks. Thanks, thank Jack. you so much.